In this video, we're going to look at the interaction between rotational energy levels and vibrational energy levels and how this interaction leads to deviations from this ideal type of rho vibrational spectrum which we looked at where the spacing between peaks in the P branch and the R branch is the same. So we first approximated the energy levels of a simultaneously rotating and vibrating diatomic molecule as just a sum of the vibrational energy which is the vibrational frequency times the vibrational quantum number n plus one half and the rotational energy which is the rotational constant b bar times the rotational quantum number j times j plus one and both n and j start at zero and are, and are integers that go up from there and we have this selection rule that the change in the vibrational quantum number delta n equals plus one for absorption of a photon and for the change in the rotational quantum number during that transition we have that that is plus or minus one giving us the R branch for plus one and P branch for minus one and if we look at what the frequencies are if we subtract the difference between these energy levels of delta N equals plus one and delta J equals either plus one or minus one we get the vibrational frequency plus 2B bar times J plus one for the R branch and the vibrational frequency for the p branch the the photon absorption frequency of the p branch equals the vibrational frequency minus 2 times the rotational constant b bar times j but if we look at actual rho vibrational spectra we'll see that that's not exactly the case that if you stare at it for enough time you'll see that the spacings between adjacent bars in the P branch is larger than that for adjacent bars in the R branch. So we want to answer in this video the question, why is that the case? So to do that, what we're first going to look at is the potential energy surface of a vibrating molecule and the various um, vibrational energy levels which are present. So if we have some interatomic potential energy, V of R, with R increasing to the right here, then we can have some rotational energy levels like this, and there will be a good number of them that are bound, but we want to look at what the expectation value for R is, or what the bond length is for various states. Now in a perfectly harmonic oscillator, it would be the same at every single energy level because the potential is symmetric on both sides. But in real molecules, this potential isn't perfectly symmetric. It's anharmonic. So it's actually much stiffer on this low end of the bond length side, and it's much softer on this, on this larger bond length side. So adding in more terms in the Taylor series would give you an expectation value for the bond length, which increases slightly as you go to higher and higher uh, rotational, sorry, vibrational levels. So the expectation value of R for some general state N would be larger than it would be for the N equals zero state. And because of this, we have an effect which alters these energy levels uh, of rotation as a function of the vibrational energy level. So we can look at these in terms of now our E bar of N and J is that same function of vibration, omega bar times n plus one half. But now our rotational constant b depends on the vibrational quantum number n. And it's still b so n times j times j plus one. Okay, so we can describe this b of n of some rotational level n as the following. We can describe that as some equilibrium or kind of default rotational constant B bar E minus alpha bar E times N plus one half. And then this constant alpha bar E we would just refer to as something like the rotation vibration interaction constant. So it's going to determine how much the bond lengthening at higher rotational levels affects our rotational constant. And so what is 
what, what does this end up meaning for us? Well, we can see that since as n goes up, that means our bond length L is going to go up slightly. Because L is in the moment of inertia, that means our moment of inertia goes up. And because that moment of inertia is in the denominator of our rotational constant, that means our rotational constant goes down. So this alpha is going to be some positive value, and this B of N is going to decrease as N increases. Okay, so what does this mean for our various energy levels here? So if we have our R branch, which I'll write here, it's frequency of some peak in the R branch has the omega bar R, then that's going to be the energy of <coughs> n equals 1, j equals j plus 1, minus the energy of n equals 0, j, the transition from this level to this level. And similarly for the P branch, if we have omega bar B, that's going from E1, J minus 1, minus E0, J. Okay, so what do the values of these end up coming out to be? Well, if you substitute in this expression here, down there, what you'll eventually arrive at is that for omega R, you'll get something like omega bar plus 2B bar 1 plus 3 b bar 1 minus b bar 0 times j, then plus b bar 1 minus b bar 0 j squared. And similarly for the p branch, what we're going to have is our omega bar p. It's going to be this expression here, substituting that in, omega bar minus b bar 1 plus b bar 0 times j, and then plus the same b bar 1 minus b bar 0 times j squared. <coughs> now what can we see in here? Well, this term here is the same in both cases. There's a quadratic term that depends on j. You can see if we estimate, if we turn on the fully rigid rotor approximation, that would mean alpha e equals 0 and b1 equals b0. So under the fully rigid rotor, this term goes away. It's not present. So this is accounting, this is accounting for some of those couplings between vibration and rotation in this, in this way. And what this is going to do is um, also we can notice that since b bar 1 is less than b bar 0, this whole term is going to be less than zero. So there's going to be this negative quadratic term, which as you increase get, is going to pull your values further negative. So that's going to make the values of the R branch get closer together because they're increasing in, in frequency and it's going to pull them towards lower values. Whereas the P branch, um, they're decreasing in frequency as you go up in J. So this quadratic um, negative term here is going to actually push them further apart. So that's one term that's contributing to this effect of the P branch being more spread out than the R branch. And then similarly we can see in this other term here 3 B bar 1 minus B bar naught and B bar 1 plus B bar 0. Now this term up here is less than this term here because b bar 1 is less than b bar 0, you can see that the, this is the linear term, which determines, it's the dominant term determining the spacings between these levels. So this term is smaller than this term. So that means then that that default linear spacing between these uh, peaks in the R branch, that term is smaller than it is for the P branch. So the peaks in the R branch, again, are going to be pushed closer together than the P branch will. And that's an effect that again goes away if you set alpha E equals to zero and then this just becomes 2B bar and this also becomes 2B bar. So it's really all depends on the value of this constant here, this rotation vibration interaction constant alpha bar E. 
And alpha bar E and B bar E are both things which have been tabulated for a large number of molecules, and you can find these constants in textbooks or whatever uh, reference sources for spectroscopy you might uh, be interested in or look up. So that's just how rotations and vibrations uh, affect the look of this rho vibrational spectrum and this pretty simple model here for for approximating that the bond length gets larger at higher vibrational levels has really given us two ideas that definitely predict this type of effect.